government was going to get an unfair advantage to this one company because they did that. Um, in, the, in the commercial world, many com or some companies wouldn't think twice about that. Some companies have adopted the same $25 as the government has. But you know, because it came into the contracting officers, all the contracting officers, they wouldn't think anything about that. Others would. So things that you can get away with, or things that are perfectly natural in the commercial space, not good in, in the government world. Um, contract, the contract itself may also decide whether something is allowable or not allowable. So we talked about these task order proposals a few minutes ago. How many people remember the task order proposals we talked about a few minutes ago? Yeah, the, <laughs> yes, the hours yeah. cost. Yeah. 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 Um, it was just fast. <laughs> uh, is that an allowable cost? Because it's going to take you time to prepare those task order proposals. Is that allowable? Depends on the contract. Depends on the contract. Sometimes they are allowable, sometimes they're not allowable. So you just have to read your contract to see if it's approved. And then finally, allocability. So the government expects you to allocate your costs according to the percent of government versus commercial business. So you know, we divide the room in half, half of you are working on government business, half of you are working on commercial business. The cost of these lights. You have a, you have a commercial overhead pool and you have a government uh, overhead pool. How should the cost of these lights be allocated if half of you are doing government and half of you are doing commercial? Right, so basically you need to take your business base, how much commercial business you have, what percentage of that, if your whole is that? You take your total business and you proportion out how much is government and how much is commercial, and that's how you should be allocating your overhead costs. So that's allocable. Um, some companies try to mess with the government and they take all their commercial stuff and push it over to the government side, or vice versa, they take all their federal costs and push it over to the commercial side because the federal market is so competitive. That's not allowed in your way. Then there are these other things called cost accounting standards. And these are one of those things that big businesses have to comply with, many more of them than small companies have to comply with. But basically, they're established, these standards are established by the Cost Accounting Standards Board, and they reflect the practice that contractors use to account for costs on a federal contract. <coughs> So this is the list of cost accounting standards. I'll just read them to you. Consistency in estimating, accumulating, and reporting costs. Um, so basically that you have to have a consistent way of always estimating how much something is going to cost. So if I come in and say, how much is it going to cost to paint a 50 by 50 room? You give me a price today. If I ask one of your peers, your colleagues in your company tomorrow, they should be giving me the same price because you've all gone to the same cost estimating system and you've used that to calculate what your estimates are. Also for accumulating costs. So if you want a government contract with NIH and you want to contract with Social Security Administration, you need to collect all the NIH costs under an NIH cost pool, and you need to collect all the Social Security costs under a Social Security cost pool. And then you need to be able to report out on those costs accordingly. Um, consistency of allocating costs incurred for the same purpose. So, you know, if I'm, uh, the cost of lights needs to remain consistent. Allocation of home office expenses to segments. So how are you going to, like, you have a leadership team and they have home office expenses. How are you allocating those? Capitalization of tangible assets. How are you capitalizing your equipment? Uh, accounting for unallowable costs. So, you know, the government, uh, where, where I put the cost of my sugars on as an expense report and the government's not going to pay it, are you paying me for my sugars? Have, have you as a company decided you're going to pay me for that? And how are you capturing that uh, unallowable cost? Or, um, you know, the government doesn't want you to overwork your people. So, for example, they, they had one point where companies were bidding 40-hour work weeks. Um, but 
other companies were saying, well, I, you know, in my office, it's a standard practice that everybody works 50 hours a week. So I'm going to bid <coughs> a lower price because I know my people are going to work 50 hours, not just 40 hours. That becomes a disconnect, and that becomes unallowable cost. So we need to account for that somewhere. What is your cost accounting period? Are you like a, do you close out your books at the end of the year? Do you close it in June? When do you put it Use of standard costs for direct material and direct labor. So these are all your direct costs. So you can't say, I'm going to charge an engineer one uh, $50 an hour for this government customer, but $65 an hour for this government customer. You can have differences in your commercial versus your government rates, but not for within that. Accounting for compensated personal absence. How do you account for that? Depreciation of tan tangible cap capital assets. So this is depreciation of capital division. Um, allocation of business unit general and administrative costs to final cost objectives. So this is your GNA rates. How are you doing those? Uh, accounting for your acquisition cost of material. So not only do you have the cost of raw material, but somebody's got to be looking at all the vendors out there, figure out what the prices are, evaluating them, and keeping track of trends, and seeing changes in price. Who's doing that purchasing function? Um, composition and measurement of pension costs, if you have a pension. Adjustment and allocation of pension costs. Cost of money as an element of cost of facilities capital. So I, I simplified the example before. Um, when I said there's the engineer salary, there's GNA overhead and fee, there's another uh, cost in there that you can add, which is facilities capital cost of money, which is what this element is. And it's basically a dollar today is worth more than a dollar five years from now. So you can, there's a calculation that you can do to take advantage of that. The fact that you put all this money into your building, it's going to last you over the long term, but you spent that money today, you can, can actually get you can, uh, you can recoup a portion of that from the government. Um, accounting for cost of deferred compensation. So when you have deferred compensation type activities in the company, how do you account for that? Insurance costs. Um, if you're doing any con construction, what's the cost of money as an element of capital costs, uh, capital assets? Allocation of direct and indirects. This one was unused. And then uh, R&D type costs. So these are the cost accounting standards that you are who's ever doing your books should be well aware of because they, they float both on the commercial side as well as the federal government side. Um, they're industry standards for cost accounting and the government requires small businesses to pay attention to some of them. So large, uh, uh, one of them is this cost estimating system. Large businesses have to develop a cost estimating system. It basically estimates how much it's going to cost you to perform the work. And it's typically based on parametric models. So if the government, why do you need one of these things? We'll talk about parametric models in a second. If the government comes in today and asks you how much it's going to cost to paint the room, you give them a price, they expect to get the same price tomorrow, and they expect to get the same price that they're asking other people. So they don't want you to just, like, every time you, the government asks you for a price, they want you to figure it out. You know, um, and I just forgot I, to bring you, I'm going to do it at the beginning of the next session. So this is what a parametric model is. So let's say, for example, you were to carpet a rec room and you go to Lowe's and they give you a $6 a foot price, square foot. You, you know what the point is, that it's $6 for one, one square foot. And if it's going to be, um, you can extrapolate it out to how much it's going to cost you for 20 feet, right? You know it's going to cost you $180 because you multiply 20 times the 6. And you, so that's an example of a parametric estimate. So that's what the government's expecting you to use. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going to take a break now. And then we'll pick back up with this. Okay.